So thank you so much for the invitation. The, the topic today is going to be non-productive angiogenesis in Alzheimer's disease. We have been in recent time really interested in uh, endothelial cells and in the context of Alzheimer's disease. But first thing first, uh, important things first, no? the, the knowledge of the people that did the work. Uh, I think uh, we, we're going to be talking today about two different stories. The first one has been mainly contributed by Alicia and Maribel. Maribel was a really talented PhD student that is now at the University of Bonn in Germany. And Alicia is still here with us contributing many other projects. We have new people coming here. And in the other story, you can see here Rosanna and Nieves that did a, a, an excellent work in, in the story of microglia and Alzheimer's disease. So not only the people in the in the group, but also the collaboration. I would like to, to stay here that I, the, the data that I will be presenting is a, a big effort of collaboration between many different groups. One of them is the one of Javier. I belong to, to Javier Vitorica uh, group at Cybernet. Uh, and it has been really a pleasure to collaborate with him after we are together at Ibis here in Seville. Also a collaboration really, really productive and really interesting with Antonia Gutierrez in Malaga and con with Professor Lopez Barneo uh, also at the Ibis in, in Sevilla. I would like also to mention other collaborators like Peter Radcliffe, our Craig Institute and University of London, and in particular, Tammy Bishop, that have been really helpful with uh, many different animal models. Uh, Alberto Ravalo, uh, the, the samples, the human samples that I will be presenting today are coming from Fundación Cien in Madrid. Collaboration with uh, Jacob Corbelin in Germany that provide uh, viral vectors to infect uh, endothelial cells, Eloise Herrera in Alicante that have contributed to this work with the analysis of uh, clarified samples and also Dr. Fernando de Castro in Madrid that provide a, a, a model of uh, um, uh, multiple sclerosis in mice that was really convenient to, to, the, to the work that we did. So say that uh, we can start with the, with the main subject of my presentation and the brain constitute one of the latest frontier in the human biomedical knowledge. Inside this amazing organ resides the capacity to generate, combine and handle memories. Simple memories are already present at unicellular organisms. For instance, in bacteria, you have already memories. However, the evolution has allowed us, the, the humans and mam mammals, to, to use the memory as a base of, for all normal thinking. As an example, uh, I'm showing you this dialogue between the White Queen and Alicia in the uh, Alicia Adventure in Wonderland, where Her Majesty is arguing that the memory that only works backwards are poor memories and that she prefers those able to remember what is going to happen in the future. Indeed, nowadays we know that memory are required in the planning and execution of our daily life action. However, we are also dependent on our memories which are the consequence when we are not longer able to remember. So as an example, um, I'm showing you uh, here uh, the, 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 the case of uh, an artist you know, that was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1996 and decided to perform self-portraits to document the progression of the disease. As you can appreciate here, there is a fast decline in the ability of the author to perform something that was uh, really easy for him. He has been doing that for the whole life. And that shows you how fast uh, and incapacitant is the progression of the disease. So that is at the, at the consequence of the disease, but what is happening in the brain at the macroscopic level, and here I'm showing you two brains, one from a normal uh, person and one patient uh, suffering during the, uh, their life in, in, with dementia. And you can immediately see at the macroscopic level an atrophy of the brain tissue. And at the microscopic level, there is quite clear 
uh, signs of accumulation of extracellular protein that now we know that are formed mainly by the amyloid peptide beta, and we're going to call that A beta for the presentation. And also, the other typical hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is the hyperphosphorylated form of a protein that is called tau, and that we can recognize in the form of uh, neurofibrillar tangles in the brain. So if we want to try how we can move from, from a normal brain to a disease brain, we can use genetics and, and use the genetic risk. There are a lot of studies now outside you know, in the literature where you can see that there are two principal cell types that associate with genes with polymorphism that associated with higher risk of developing dementia later on life. And these two types of genes are microglia and endothelial uh, cells, and also mural cells uh, like pericyte, astrocyte, uh, and other cells like fibroblast. So interestingly, Alzheimer himself describes micro, microvascular changes in terms of endothelial proliferation and neovascularization. So we, we, when we started this project, we reviewed a little bit the data that was in the literature regard, regarding the, the vessels and the contribution to the, to the pathology. And there are a lot of description that say that angiogenesis, a process by which the brain can generate new blood vessels in specific condition. So markers of this process, they are accumulated in the brain areas of uh, Alzheimer's disease patient with accumulation of A beta plaques, like you can see here in the frontal cortex and the parahippocampus, but also using more recent techniques like single nuclei RNA sec. You can also see that uh, angiogenesis is a big group of uh, processes being uh, dysregulated during the process of the disease. And the same thing happened if you go to long term, like blood vessel morphogenesis, tube development, angiogenesis. So there is something going on with the vessel. Looks like that the brain is trying to generate new vessels, but at the same time, if you go to all reports in the, in the previous literature, you can see that a normal brain, mouse brain, have a really dense uh, vasculature, but in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, you get holes in the in the vascular network, and these holes are associated with uh, A beta plaques. So the same thing was shown in the human brain. Uh, and in this uh, old uh, micrography, you can see that the plaques are normally devoid of uh, vessels. And if you go now to, to these new techniques, like a, a single nuclei RNA sec, as I said before, you also find that in the, in the samples coming from human uh, suffering from AD, you get a decrease in the endothelial cells, in the pericyte, in the smooth muscle cells, in the fibroblast. However, having similar numbers of astrocyte, T cells or uh, microglia macrophages indicating that probably endothelial cells are also suffering uh, from the from the disease. So for us that was uh, a little bit surprising because for us that are coming from the from the hypoxia field. If you have less vessel, you're going to develop hypoxia, meaning you're going to have low oxygen availability in the tissue, and you're going to start uh, a process that is called angiogenesis, and that should produce new vessels in the brain. So the, the initial idea or, or working model in this project was that uh, A-beta was accumulated in the brain that displays the even distribution of the vessels in the, in the human brain, and that produced a local uh, and reduced amount of uh, low oxygen levels, hypoxia, that will induce neighbor cells to produce angiogenic uh, factors and that will be uh, read by the nearby vessels that will produce the elongation of a new vascular branch that will be uh, perfusing these uh, low oxygen areas of the brain. So we started by confirming previous data. It's true that you accumulate angiogenic markers in the brain, and it's true that you have less vessels in the human and the mouse models brains. So the first thing we did was to, to localize if you have production of EGF, 
the main angiogenic factor that is produced when you have low oxygen levels. And we found using in situ hybridization that you have a lot of BGF, normally around A beta plaques, something that was already described at the level of protein. And we also map this BGF level to astrocyte that the normal that are the normal cell that normally are contributing to the angiogenesis during development. We also use another marker, interim alpha 5 beta 3, that is a marker of angiogenic cells uh, that have been described previously that was upregulated in the brain, in the human brain of Alzheimer's disease patients. And we did the same thing in mouse models. And you can see here there is an increase in density of these uh, angiogenic cells in the mouse models, but also did a, a nice work with the sample coming from, from the lab of uh, uh, Alberto Ramano and Maria Llorens in Madrid that uh, allow us to quantify the number of cells, but not only that, but also localize that those cells, angiogenic cells, are really nearby A beta plaques in the brain and the, the mathematical analysis to, to demonstrate that was done in collaboration with Luis Maes Cudero here at, at Ibis. So the next thing that we did was to check if really we have less vessels around the, the A beta plaques as has been previously proposed in the, in the literature. By using two different markers of perfusion, one is TER-119, this marker is labeled in red cells and by injecting Evans blue in the heart, that is as a marker of perfusion, you can see that the areas that are surrounding A beta plaques, they are normally with blood vessel full of red cells with this green and white marker, but nearby A beta plaques, you get this weird structure. We will be discussing that later, labeled here with a marker that is IB4 that there are also some uh, things or sort of structure that remember vessels, but they don't longer conduct blood. So we have quantified many different markers, perfusion in two different models of Alzheimer's disease, laminin, a marker of the basement membrane of endothelial cells, uh, aquaporin-4 as a marker of the astrocytic m -feed, CD31 as a marker of endothelial cells, PDGF-R-beta as a marker of pericyte, and in all the case, uh, you get the same. As long as you are getting nearby the plaque, you lose uh, vascular marker. So we have real uh, here a, a paradoxic situation where we have angiogenic markers, so we are inducing an angiogenic process, but we have less vessel. So we, we decided to study the, the process, the full process of angiogenesis, searching for something that could be failing in the process. So the hypothesis, the working hypothesis was maybe the angiogenesis is started, but is halted in, in the middle and is altering the, the vessel that you have uh, normally to be, be producing in the, in the brain. So the next step after the production of PDF or another angiogenic factor is that the endothelial cells that receive the signal differentiate from the normal endothelial cells to an specialized cell type that is called tip cell that you have here. Tip cell is going to be a cell of the endothelium that receives BGF signal. And this cell, by receiving the signal, is going to differentiate, producing phylopoidia that will be guiding the growing of the new vascular uh, branch. But at the same time, they, they are going to express delta like 4 as a ligand for notch. And delta like 4 is going to be accumulated in the based, uh, in the basal membrane of these uh, cells to contact with the neighboring cells. By contacting delta like 4 with the neighboring cell, notch, another protein probably very well known by all people working in Alzheimer, the gamma secretase, we're going to cleave notch and produce notch intracellular domain. And this process is really important for, for new vascular tree formation because you need to, this cell is not able to, to conduct blood you need to have this new cell type that is called stock cells 
and these stock cells are gonna divide, grow, and produce the lumen that will be arriving the new blood to the to the hypoxic areas. If you have a failure in this communication, you have something that is called non-productive angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is started, but you get halt in the middle, and you have a aberrant vascular tree. Uh, uh, surrounding hypoxic areas. And that is uh, simplified here with a mutant, delta light for heterozygous. And here, what you see is images of a retina of a mouse uh, model where you don't have uh, half of the dose of delta light four. And you can see that the vascular tree is totally disorganized. And where normally you find a few tip cells guiding the growing of new vessels, you get a lot of T cells with a lot of arborization. And it's really important to say that when you get that, you are not longer to conduct blood because these vessels, they are uh, interrupted in the, in, the, in, in the perfusion of the specific tissues. So we wonder if non-productive angiogenesis could be contributing to this loss of vascular uh, branches that we observe both in the in the human and in the mouse model. So to do that, what we did was to, with Maribel, we developed a new uh, method to isolate adult endothelial cells from really all mice, from wild type and Alzheimer's disease mouse model. Uh, normally, people use CD31 to isolate those cells, but yet you can see here, if you use CD31, you are, you are also getting a lot of microglia, macrophages that are also labeled with CD11B, not surprisingly, because they are derived from the same uh, progenitor in the, in the, in the ontogeny, and they, they share many different markers. So what we did was to to do a negative selection for CD11B to remove those cells and a positive for CD31. And, and, and you can observe in the graph that the using endothelial markers, it is uh, really endothelial cells that we got, but we don't see contamination by other cell types in the brain. So the next uh, question that we did is if we isolate the mRNA from the endothelial cells of uh, Alzheimer's disease mouse models and wild type, and we do a, a, a global transcription study. Do we see difference uh, in the non-productive angiogenesis process that I've been explaining to you before? So what we did, as I say, was to do a, a microarrays with the RNA isolated for, for these fat isolated endothelial cells. And we use one gene set that we call delta like for app genes that was produced produced by the lab of Ann Hman in Paris a long time ago, uh, just taking advantage that the postdoc that did that, Raquel del Toro is already at Atibis, uh, and she had the knowledge on, on those genes. And we did a gene set enrichment analysis. And interestingly, the genes that are upregulated when you have a failure in lateral inhibition, when you have a problem on non-productive angiogenesis, was the gene that were more upregulated in endothelial cells of uh, Alzheimer's disease mouse models. So that implied that the notch signaling probably is interrupted around a beta plaques. To confirm that, we got a mouse model that drive the expression of a fluorescent marker, uh, drive the expression of notch intracellular domain by expressing a nuclear uh, venous protein. And we quantify the amount of vessels and auxiliar cells with notch staining surrounding A beta plaques and far away from from A beta plaques. And you can see both in controls, in in a mouse model where you if you are distal to A beta plaques, you don't have a, a big change in the, the number of cells expressing notch uh, transcriptional activity, but you you get a strong decrease uh, around A beta plaques, confirming that something is going wrong with the uh, notch uh, pathway around A beta plaques. So the next thing that we did was to use a, a marker of angiogenic cells that is called IB4, that is a lectin that is sustaining the luminal and the luminal uh, side of the endothelium. 
And by doing that, you can see the result. We found something really aberrant around EBITDA plaques. You can recognize here the EBITDA plaques labeled with an asterisk in the micrography. And we call that a, a, a sugar candy model because you have a stick that are the well perfused vessel. But as long as you get nearby the plaque, you get this fuzzy structure that is really disorganized and you no longer see perfusion of blood in this region. We have quantified that and always that is co-localized with the beta plaques in the brain parenchyma. And there is a perfect correlation between the area of the plaques and the area of the abnormal IV4 staining that we have called vascular scars. Uh, in, in, a, in a acronym that we call VAS. And if you see that in low magnification, IB4 in the brain only stain for vessels. But if you go to two different models of A-beta accumulation, you get those aberrant structures that are areas without uh, perfusion that can be really fast in, in eight months in some, in some models, it can be 5% of the cortex, imagine the, the decrease in perfusion that you are getting in the cortex by, by this aberrant structure. And recently, with the add the, the of uh, uh, Juan de la Sierra researcher in the group, Juanjo Perez Moreno, that did clarification of um, brain slices and uh, uh, interpretation of that with the Imari software. And you can see here is one millimeter thick uh, slide. And here is the, the vascular tree that you observe in a, in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And if you see this uh, vas and you go to high magnification, you can see uh, that, the, that you have really big areas inside the brain that where the vessel, they are not longer conducting blood and they are forming this aberrant structure. So with uh, the aid of uh, Antonia Gutierrez in Malaga, we were able to localize it before to the extracellular uh, parenchyma, extracellular space of the parenchyma by using, uh, I don't know if I can call that immunogold because we are not using antibodies, but by a lectin, but the lectin is con conjugated to gold particles. And then you can see that the, the labeling is mainly in the extracellular part of the cell looking like there is a distribution of the extracellular matrix of the endothelial cells that are being lost. That is generating a pond around a beta plaques. It's like something that is being uh, distributed randomly around the, the, the a beta plaques. So we went back to literature and searched for those structures in the human brains. And we found something that is called vascular ghost that can be recognized with different marker of uh, the basement membrane matrix. And you can see here using Perlecan, Agrin, and other markers. And the author described that as something associated to a vessel, but present fuzzy uh, structure always surrounding a beta plaques. So it looks like that what we observe in the in the brain of a mouse model is also taking place in the in the human AV. So the, our model predict that if you have a failure in angiogenesis, you should be accumulating deep cells. So our initial idea was that this fuzzy structure, the vas, was formed by the philopodia of those deep cells. But Alicia in the, in the lab insisted me that was not philopodia, and Antonia uh, really verified that at the electronic, electronic microscopy level. So our model predicts a lot of T cells. Where are they? Why we cannot see those deep cells? So we are we generated a new mouse model with a tomato labeling of endothelial cells, so we can really uh, see easily the, the vascular tree. And we were able to localize not so much, but a few of them deep cells, you can see here in high magnification, and you see some of the projection. But at the same time that we have a new deep cells in the brain, they are always nearby a beta plaques. But every time that we see that, we see a microglia cell that is nearby and is surrounding this, the projection of those cells. So probably those cells are being recognized by microglia, and the, the, the initial idea that we had, probably they are being removing from the parenchyma by the activity of those microglia cells. So we decided to go further and study the contribution of microglia to vessel planning around 
a beta plax. You can see in this micrography, I have one, a marker uh, of microglia in white and, and in red tomato. Sorry, I think I, I got a problem with PowerPoint. I need to restart the presentation. I think I still connected. That happens sometime. Uh, I'm that, still connected, Alberto. Okay, good. That is going to be fast. I don't know why my PowerPoint sometimes decide to stop. I'm always in the middle of a presentation, of course. <laughs> Just localizing where I was. Okay, here we go again. Sorry. Remember going to full screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. So, okay, so uh, I was saying, let me put again the pointer and the green color that I think is better than the red in this case. Okay, so as you can see, you have microglia that can be interacted with the vessel everywhere in the parenchyma, but if you go nearby the plaques, you start to see the microglia, in addition to be attending to the A-beta plaques, they are also surrounding uh, the vessels. And in the video, you can see a 3D reconstruction where a blood vessel is fully uh, surrounded by microglia. So we search for phagocytic figures of microglia that could be indicating phagocytosis of, micro, of blood vessels by microglia. And uh, the nice work of uh, Amanda Sierra in, in Achucarro uh, Center in the uh, base country, they, they really show that when microglia is eating something, they generate what they call a model in a chain and ball, and they call that pouches. And that those pouches around a beta plaques normally are filled with a beta, but you can also find these small pouches here containing tomato positive material that are coming from the from the vessel. So I'm showing you here a 3D reconstruction, several different examples of a beta the plaques surrounded by microglia, where you can see that uh, tomato is inside, and that is really frequent around maybe the plaques. So here are a small video where you can see the 3D, these small uh, pouches. So we think really microglia is taking care of the, the vessels around Evita plaques. Uh, probably they are having a problem in angiogenesis, they become leakage, and the microglia is just closing them to avoid a bigger problem. So just to demonstrate the involvement of Notch in this process, you, we take advantage of a mouse model that we have in the lab, that is the gamma secretase deficient mouse model, and in combination with a nice virus uh, developed in Germany by Jakob Korbeling, where they have mutated the capside of adeno-associated virus when you inject those virus in the tail vein, normally you get uh, accumulation of those virus in the liver, but the mutated form of those viruses are going to the brain and they are infecting specifically endothelial cells. So that was a wonderful uh, tool for us. So we could use a floxet mice of PCN1, the catalytic subunit of gamma secretase, and the, in a background for uh, full cow of presenilin 2 that is fully viable. So we can generate a mutant where we have deleting gamma secretase activity only in endothelial cells by using injection of control or cream mice to different, to different uh, animals. And surprisingly, uh, we, we didn't expect that, but it's what we got. Uh, we got in the control a normal vessel that is normally perfused with Evans blue, but in the mutant, when we inject the Cree mice, you get that the, this, those brain develop in the absence of a beta pathology, just by disrupting the gamma secretase activity in the endothelial cells, you get this vast structure that are also poorly perfused in comparison with the normal one. Not only that, also microglia is recognizing those structures 
and they are phagocytating those uh, abnormal blood vessels. Here I have a high magnification image where you can see a microglia nearby a blood vessel, and they are starting to show this chain and ball uh, structure with tomato, in this case, IB4 positive material, always surrounding a vessel. So, as a final statement of this uh, initial part of the, of the presentation, that is going to be the longer part, don't be worried. So we can say in our model that uh, A-beta is displacing a little bit the blood vessel that produce hypoxia, uh, BGF, extrusion of tip cells, but those tip cells, they cannot develop a new vascular branch, so they become halt in the in the process and this problem is recognized by microglia digesting those cells but probably the leaving behind the the extracellular matrix of the basement membrane that is what we recognize in the parenchyma so just to show you a little bit of uh, what we did in another story and it, i think it's important what is the the relevance of this process for the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So we thought, okay, microglial cells are not only the ones that uh, are reducing the, the vessel by phagocyting them, but they are also the unique cell that survive, survive near the beta plaques. So are they suffering for low oxygen levels? So to do that, we did an experiment with the isolation of microglial cell in collaboration with uh, with Javier Vitorica and Carmen Romero here at TVs and um, from many different mouse models and we, if we go to the literature you get many other different we were able to observe that those cell has high activity of uh, HIF1 that is a transcriptional factor activate under low oxygen levels in the microglia isolated from those model in comparison with white type. But surprisingly, they also have a high activation of the transcription of the genes involved encoding the OxFox system. So here is really a paradox situation where we have low oxygen level, high HIP1 alpha level, high mitochondrial uh, transcription to uh, HIV-1 should be inhibited in mitochondria. We did a lot of studies in, in that, but to, 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 to show you really, I think the key data from this story, the first thing that we did was to confirm that in the in the human brain, in collaboration with Javier, we did an analysis of the heat level by Western blood in human samples, and you can see during the progression of the disease, there is there is an accumulation in the in the parenchyma of, of HIV. We also measured several HIV one alpha target genes, and they are also upregulated at the latest stages of the disease. And for the mitochondrial part, we also reanalyze single nuclei data set from other authors and observe that the cells coming from AD patients, they have high levels of expression of mitochondrial genes. And in a different study, they also reported here in brown there are genes related with oxidative phosphorylation and in, in purple, they are related with a low oxygen level. And you can see mainly the, the first thing that you find in those analysis of uh, transcriptional dysregulation in Alzheimer's disease is the activation in microglia of these two pathways. So in collaboration with Javier and with Antonia, we, got, we were able to show that HIF was a, an unwanted response for microglial cell, was, a, was a, an stress that was there probably due to the, to the low uh, oxygen level produced by the lost of, uh, of the blood vessels, and we were able to further uh, increase the level of HIV using both a, a genetic trick and a, and a exposition of those mice to low oxygen level, and the result the result were similar. If you increase the level of HIV both genetically or environmentally, you get a decrease in the number of microglial cells surrounding the plaques, and if you study that in humans. In humans, it's a little bit more complicated because you cannot do, you cannot uh, uh, know what are the normal oxygen levels of one specific patient and compare with another one. So we thought maybe different areas in the brain they have different oxygen levels, and we can do intra-patient comparison instead of inter-patient comparison. 
So we selected based on the literature the dentite gyros as a hypoxic area because it's really an area with a high number of nuclei and the same amount of vessel than the rest of the brain. Um, Antonia nicely showed in those brains that you can have nude plaques we have with that without uh, microglial coverage. And in, when you compare that with a normoxic tissue, like in the perirenal cortex, you see that you have a far better coverage of microglia in those areas. And that correlate, if you have a good coverage of microglia, you have less dystrophic neurites around, staining here with phosphotau. And the less microglia you have, the higher the, the pathology that you observe. So just to finish the, this one, uh, I'm going to use only maybe five more minutes to show you what we are doing right now. But uh, just a, as a take home message that I think we have shown a, a nice uh, model that is non-productive angiogenesis involving endothelial cells as a new victim of Alzheimer's disease. And also that have consequences of uh, the microglia activity on the brain of Alzheimer's disease. And we call that my, my metabolic induction of microglial quiescent. We call that mechanism uh, mimic and we are still working on, on that. But just to show you if the hypothesis here is that the, is the starting of angiogenesis that is provoking the disruption of the nearby vessels, what we did was to block the initiation of angiogenesis to see if we can recover a little bit the, uh, the progression of the disease. Say that we are not planning to treat patients with angiogenic inhibitors as a, as a proof of concept. Okay, so we selected sorafenib, that is a, a inhibitor of several kinases, between of them uh, the BGF receptor kinase. And the sorafenib, the first thing that we did was we were able to reduce the number of angiogenic cells in the treated mice. So sorafenib is reaching the brain and is taking a, a it is making an effect over angiogenesis in the APP mouse model. We also observe that we increase the coverage of pericytes of the vessels in the brain. We reduce a little bit the size of the plaque, not the amount of AB in the brain, but yes, the, the, the size. And that was correlated with a trend, not significant, of the to, to improve the memory of those animals here used in the novel object recognition uh, test. So, because probably sorafenib is, is making a strong uh, uh, phenotype in the brain, we wanted to do something more specific in that we have been uh, founded with a new plan national project now to study that. So what we did is using uh, uh, our data from the microarray, from the isolated endothelial cells, we have localized several pathways that are downstream, not intracellular domain, and that are done regulated in endothelial cells of Alzheimer's disease model. And one of them is CRG, a transcription factor of endothelial cell, free cell for uh, uh, one component of the beta catenin uh, pathway, and all of them are involved in the maturation of the blood brain barrier. So we went back to our data here I'm showing you the accumulation of angiogenic uh, marker, the decrease of free cell 4. And if you go again to the data set of human, you can see an increase on angiogenic factors and a decrease of the gene that are regulated by notch intracellular domain. So we also, in collaboration with Javier, we have determined the levels of ERG and other genes uh, in the different areas of the human brain, frontal cortex and hippocampus. And you, you see that with the progression of the disease, there is a clear accumulation of ERG in those brains. And interestingly, using two different scales uh, for dementia, we see that there is a correlation between the levels of ERG higher the level of ERG, lower the cognitive capacities of the individuals. So there is a nice correlation and I think it's worth it to, to continue investigating uh, those data. So what we did already was to use this tool of so overexpressing notch intracellular domain using the, those viruses in the brain of an Alzheimer's disease mouse model. By doing that, we're gonna rescue the loss of notch intracellular domain in endothelial cells. And we are characterizing now at the histological level those mice, but you can see already that we recover the memory problem of those mice. And we are 
planning to use also. We have the virus. We do the virus in collaboration with the Scenic unit for for viral production. Um, Juan Bernal over there. And we are we have now also viruses to overexpress CRG and the and a always active beta catenin form. And just two more slides, if I may. Uh, just to show you another thing that I, th I think is really interesting in the data set coming from, from the OR array, we, we observe a bunch of genes that are really down-regulated in Alzheimer's disease and endothelial cells, but really, really strongly down-regulated. Just to show you the data, the third more down-regulated gene, they are not expressed in the endothelial cell. You can see here endothelial cell gene, like e ERG, but these three one, they become to astrocyte, uh, to the astrocyte, not to endothelial cell. So here our hypothesis is, is that those genes are really attached to the membrane of the endothelial cells when we purify that, and we don't know why when we purify the endothelial cells from the Alzheimer's disease mouse model, the astrocytic end fit is no longer there. So probably we are losing the RNA that is producing producing local translation in the end fit. So we are really interested now in studying this interaction between the end fit and the endothelial cells in the context of Alzheimer's disease and the relation of this uh, modification with the, the pathway that have been shown before. Sorry to be to be so long. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, I thank you again for the attention. I will be happy to, to answer any question that you may have. All right, thank you very much, Alberto, for a very nice presentation. So now the paper is open for discussion. As I said earlier, um, if anyone wants to make a question to uh, Alberto, please do so by raising your hand using the um, um, the option in your um, screen or by sending me a, um, a message through the chat, just stating your name and your interest in posting a question. There is no need for you to write down the question, so you can do it um, directly to Alberto. Um, and th there okay. is one. There is one. Yeah, there, is, there is one question in the chat actually, which is uh, the, the the actual question is posted there. So if you wanna, uh, the question is from Ana Dacil Marrero. Um, if you wanna read the question, if you can, uh, Alberto. And yes, I will. So Ana, th thank you for the for the question. I think it's a really important point. So the implication for a beta. Let me show you one slide. We think that the beta is a, and we are really working on that now, that the beta is an inhibitor of gamma secretase activity because it's the product of the gamma secretase activity. So as you can see here, there are many mutations of gamma secretase associated with Alzheimer's disease. This is presenting one and all the red dots are Alzheimer's disease mutation, and they are really loss of function mutation for notch activity and for I beta you can have an, in, an accumulation of a beta 42 in those patients but you have really and that have been demonstrated by many different groups not by yourself you have a, a really a, a loss of the activity over notch of uh, when you get mutation in gamma secretase but the interesting thing is the gamma secretase inhibitor is a peptide uh, one of them is a peptide that match the sequence of a beta 42. So the hypothesis is not my hypothesis, it's Ji Shen that um, proposed that long time ago, is that the a beta 42 is an inhibitor the gamma of gamma secretase activity because you have still two cleavage points that you need to use, but you have lost the indication where you need to cleave by the gamma secretase activity that are those amino acids here. Sorry, I will activate the pointer. So you have here the in red the amino acid that you need for guiding the cleavage of the gamma secretase. If you have accumulation of A beta 42, you need still to cleave this protein, but you don't have the signal to localize the cleavage point. So probably you are slowing down the activity. The idea is around A beta plant, you have 
have a lot of A-beta-42, and that can be inhibiting activity of gamma secretase in the membrane of the endothelial cells, avoiding a normal uh, angiogenic uh, process. Okay. All right, thank you, Alberto. Um, any other question? Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, uh, Jose Lopez Barneo wants to make a question. Pepe, yeah. just go ahead, please. Hey, thank you, Alberto, very nice. Thank you. I you know, but I always ask you many questions about this project because it's very, rather, very beautiful, but very complicated. I wanted again to ask you which is that we what is triggering the the abnormal angiogenesis the a, a beta inhibiting gamma secretase is the primary factor inhibiting angio, inhibiting I mean uh, producing abnormal angiogenesis non productive angiogenesis this is <laughs> one question the second is the alteration of microglial phagocytosis is yet secondary to hypoxia is not a primary factor of induced by a beta. It's just secondary to the hypoxia produced uh, in the in the neighborhood, uh, in the embryos of the of the of the plaque. Okay. 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 The first one we don't know. It's really difficult to show that a beta is an inhibitor of gamma secretase. We are that in the new project. We have an in vitro uh, uh, setup. Uh, we want to search if really A beta is able to inhibit gamma secretase activity. That uh, you cannot do that with IPP because IPP is cleavage inside the uh, cells, or that is the theory that the APP is, is internalized and is going to be cleavage to produce A beta in, in the in, inside the cell to be later exposed outside. But for endothelial cells, the cleavage of notch is in the membrane that have been demonstrated. So we are using endothelial cells where that they are able to activate notch intracellular domain and they are using gamma secretase activity. And we're going to add over that A beta 42, okay. A beta 38, and we're going to see if we are able to demonstrate that. But it's really complicated. The genetic is pointing to gamma secretase activity over notch in the implication related with uh, with the blood vessel. So the the other question, uh, with the microglia is activated by A beta that have been shown by many different people. The problem is that is microglia is generating a low oxygen level around A beta plaques because probably the vessel is becoming leakage around the plaques. And I have been described, I've been searching a lot in which situation in the brain microglia can eat vessels and you get that only when you have a stroke and you have release of the blood in the brain. At that time, microglia recognized ATP is going to the vessel and is going to cauterize the vessels to avoid any further uh, distribution of the blood because an hemorrhage that will be far worse that decrease the number of vessels. So it's a really complicated process because everything is adding on top of that. So you, yeah. you get a, you get activation of microglia, you are probably consuming a lot of oxygen that is decreasing the ability of microglia to react to the plaque, but at the same time microglia is destroying the, the vessel because they are altered by the E-beta. So everything is related uh, one with each other. So just to put uh, order in this process is it's not so easy, no? But but it's something okay. that we would try. Thank you, Alberto. I think it's a very nice view of this uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, of the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. And Thank congratulations you. again for your work. Thank you, Pepe. Thank you, Pepe. Um, we got another um, question in writing, and this is one is from Silvia Martin. If you, you can read it, Alberto. Okay, so Silvia, hi, hi Silvia. Nice to see you here, or not to see you here. <laughs> so, uh, have, have you been able to explore the direct effect of hypoxia on pericide and secondarily in the endothelium? Or you think it's an effect or the endothelium that secondarily have an impact on pericide coverage? Again, it's a chicken and egg problem. No, what is the first? Uh, we haven't analyzed uh, hypoxic mice, but we are starting to do now because when we published this paper on endothelial cell, we have realized that uh, people from vascular in the brain feels like the vasculature is, is there for always. It's not going to change 
but uh, as coming from the hypoxic field, we know if we expose the mice to hypoxia, or if you go to high altitude, you're going to have uh, angiogenesis in the brain and you are going to generate new vessels. So we are exposing now wild-time mice to study how the blood-brain barrier and the neurovascular unit is formed and this form after this angiogenic process and to try to see what is fair and what is second no, in the in the situation. It's not, again, it's not an easy, an easy thing, but what we see is a decrease in ERG um, beta catenin that have been described during development as involved in the BBB formation. So we think really we are altering angiogenesis and at that time we are also altering the formation of the BBB and the new vessels. So we'll see. All right, thank you again, um, Alberto um, and Silvia for the question. Um, there is a um, couple of minutes for um, another question, if there is any. Um, yeah, there is a question from Jesus de Pedro. Jesus, go ahead. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question related to the rapid course dementia, which are reported to the National Registry of Prion Disorders and with a suspicion of a Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Uh, surprisingly, as Alberto Rano knows, in an important proportion of patients uh, where Kreufel-Jakob is, is discarded, appears some kind of diagnosis related to vascular dementia. Do you think that this process you described today uh, can be extended to other situations in the brain, not only to Alzheimer's disease? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Really, really interesting question. Uh, we have checked all their models of uh, neurodegeneration so far, uh, sclero multiple sclerosis, tau accumulated models with hyperphosphorylation. And normally when we see an infection model or activation of the innate immune system and the endothelial cells, we see an alteration of the blood brain barrier in the arteriole, but not in the capillar. Uh, like we see here in the in this model, okay. So we we really have a, a difference between AD models and other that is touching the the capillars and not the artery or the arteriole. And we have been, for instance, really in a, in a last working collaboration with Juan Toledo at TVs uh, 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 using a model of COVID infection of the brain. We have been able to see an opening of the arterioles in the brain and high uh, inflammation of those areas, but that is di really, really different of what we see in Alzheimer's disease. So I don't really know which one will be in the case that you see, but if you have infection, you're going to have a different uh, behavior of the vessel than if you have uh, AV accumulation. I don't want to say Alzheimer's so fast. I have shown only a beta accumulation and it's related really with a beta plaques. And we'll see with other, maybe in that cohort, you have also problem with accumulation of a beta that has not been detected. That I don't know. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alberto and Jesus thank you for much. the question. Um, so I haven't received any other question unless there is Pepe. You want to make another question or this? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay. seeing, seeing okay. we have Al uh, Albert available now. Okay. okay sure. and, you know, I have I have one question related to your uh, former discussion. Okay, regarding the effect of uh, the re reaction of the brain to infection versus Alzheimer's disease. In your model, do you see any effect of a beta on the vessels that have been already formed? I mean, the the existing vessel, not the not the angiogenesis, but the vessels already in the brain. They, 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 they have a, they, you affect only the, the vessels that are nearby the beta plaques. So you are disassembling the vessels that are in the area around a beta plaques. The other, in fact, they are trying okay. to grow inside the plaque, but you are not altering other vessels that are but, far away. So but you think really that the mechanism, 
but the vessel destruction that you see in the exactly. around the the, the beta plug you see is a question of a destruction of aggression of the pathology to the vessel that, that already exists there for example because uh, because a, a microglial cells are uh, phagocyting them for example or it is a problem of the uh, of the turnover of the vessels. Okay, I mean, I mean, the only problem is angiogenesis, and as you are inhibiting or you are generating an abnormal angiogenesis, you are affecting the vessels. I don't, I don't know if you, if you understand my question. Is, uh, totally. Could is, be, whether or not you are, yeah, okay, you are affecting be, could the be. vessels already made. Yes, could be that the the microglia activity, inflammatory activity is activating the, the capillaries and they are being recognized by microglia as aberrant and they are okay, being degraded yeah. independently of uh, a beta. And that is why we want to test notch intracellular domain activation. Uh, or I have showed you just one graph showing rescue of behavior of those mice by expressing notch intracellular domain in those cells and that will indicate that there is really an angiogenic process that is uh, failing and that is not any specific activity of microglia over, over those cells. At the beginning of this work, we tried to prove both things, to try to study the inflammatory component and the angiogenic component. And after many, many the, work... Uh, yes. Alberto, but, but the notch in the cellular domain plays any role in the maintenance of the normal vessels. So it plays a role only in the formation of new vessels. That is the interesting thing. You can remove notch in the adult vasculature and you're going to have a normal uh, structure. Okay. Okay. So that, that that's, is, that's, the is the, that's the point, yes. And so okay. you don't need that to, to maintain the BBBB. So, so it's, okay. it's, if we can rescue that, it's meaning that we are altering angiogenesis. Angiogenesis by itself, okay. okay. By itself, Thank yes. you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Pepe and Alberto. Uh, there is uh, one other question from Silvia Marin Martin. Uh, again, um, is in writing. If you want to read it, Alberto. Still, ah, now it's okay. Okay. Have you considered similar vascular alteration beyond the brain in other vascular area in the body in the concept of systemic vascular defect? Okay, we don't, uh, at least I don't know where in the body can be accumulating a beta. So I don't know. It could be interesting to see if there is other organ. I think there are few other organs where it has been described a beta accumulation. And if you have a beta accumulation, the prediction will be you're going to have vascular uh, problem too. If they are in a way producing hypoxia, disrupting normal uh, or inducing angiogenesis uh, and everything. For instance, if you use cell tumor to the back of the of the uh, of a mouse that is going to induce angiogenesis, and you put a beta inside of the tumor, you block angiogenesis in the tumor. So a beta is able to stop angiogenesis in tumors. In the in new mice, is able to avoid angiogenesis in several fish. If you inject a beta 42 in the developing several fish, you have an aberrant vasculature. So every time that you have a beta, you have associated locally a problem with the vessel. So the question I do is is, is reverse. Do you have other places in the in the organism where you have a bit accumulation in the body? If you have that, we could study if you have a, 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 an aberrant uh, vascular uh, problem. No? All right, thanks again, Alberto. Um... Um, I don't see any other uh, question coming. Um, so um, yeah, let's wait for a few seconds, just in case. Okay. Okay. All right. So no more questions coming. So I think it's time to, um, to close the session, but not before thanking Alberto uh, very much for a very nice presentation and uh, his willingness to share with us um, his work. Uh, thank you everyone for um, uh, attending and uh, for a nice uh, lively discussion and um, and that's it we'll see you or some of you at least for the next webinar next week and i uh, wish you all a great afternoon bye 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 thank you